Um, we have Jenny List here from DAISY. She is a member of virtually any committee in the IOC organization that you can think of. And all of the relevant ones, at least. Uh, so I think you're, you're one of the best uh, people to explain this story to this audience here today. Thank you for coming. And go ahead. Yeah. Yeah, thanks a lot, Marcel, first of all, for inviting me and also for the nice introduction. So, um, oops, this is not good. I should stay away from that thing, so I guess I find my place here on this side. <laughs> Auditorium, good. Yeah, as Marcel already said, um, the main topic of today will be the physics program of future electron <coughs> positron colliders. And uh, since uh, this is an open colloquium, and I assume that not everybody is a particle physicist here, I will try to explain a bit in the beginning on, on what we are doing and what we are aiming for at all. And then, of course, the main part will be on, on the more detailed plans. If you have questions on the more technical aspects, you can ask, or the political aspects, you can ask <laughs> in the end, but this will not. Uh, a pop up in the talk. Just for my information, who is uh, actually a particle physicist in here? Uh, who does not consider him or herself a particle physicist? Okay, so, whoa, <laughs> good. <laughs> okay, so I hope you still, still enjoy the, the introduction. Okay, so this is what the particle data group uh, few years ago assembled about what we think we know today about our universe and its evolution. So we are sitting here, the Big Bang is over here, and uh, um, as, as you all know, the universe expanded and cooled down, so higher energies are here, and uh, today rather low energies, um, yeah, and you see here galaxies, ourselves, photons, black holes, neutrinos, and of course these galaxies formed at some point, yeah, which is sort of symbolized here by this disk. And actually, um, yeah, we have also something, uh, as we call the last scattering surface, the, where the universe became transparent. So this is basically here. And why did it become transparent? Because that's the point in time where the universe was cool enough so that atoms could form. Right. So before there were... Uh, protons and electrons separately and no photon could get anywhere without being absorbed. So this is here the, re, the, the part of the history of the universe which one could sort of uh, analyze with astronomy. And, uh, but if we want to go down here, we need particle physics, uh, physics and accelerators. So why do we want to know about this time? Well, there are many things which we don't understand actually about all this big picture. One of the most obvious things is that, uh, um, unless we are considering Star Trek, um, there is no antimatter around in our universe, right? So um, everything we see is mostly matter, unless we make cumbersomely make some antimatter. And uh, what we, the mechanism where the antimatter, yeah, which at some point, if you believe in the Big Bang, must have been created in sort of equal amounts with the matter. Um, where all this vanished, we call it sort of baryogenesis, and uh, we know that the, um, this must have happened very early in the universe because already here at this stage the antimatter was gone. Then, also very famous, the dark matter. For instance, this is absolutely needed to explain the step of structure formation. We also know that this, whatever it is, yeah, it, is uh, uh, it has to have its origin back there. And also, um, this famous picture of, the, of this disk here, the cosmic microwave background, is, is a mystery because it's across the whole universe. It's very homogeneous. And uh, it's actually so homogeneous that we know that parts of the universe which are so far apart that during the whole age of the universe, light could not have traveled from one patch to the other. Yeah? So no communication would have been possible. They are very, very similar. And this is actually the basic idea why we have this very sharp increase here in size, which is called, called inflation, and which explains sort of that effect. So as you see, most of the questions, the very fundamental ones, really point back here. And if you look at the, I enlarged this <laughs> energy labels here a bit for you. So this disk back here just uh, carries 
average photon energy of photons flying around at this time of 100 GeV was uh, uh, a tenth of the nanoseconds after the Big Bang, right? And so this is exactly the ty type of energy uh, yeah, colliders are dealing with. Okay, so if we stay with these three questions for a while, what do we know already? So for the dark matter, we know, first of all, that there is five times more of it, roughly, than in our universe than normal matter, right? So it's not just a small addition, it's actually most of the matter. It must be electrically neutral, otherwise it would not be dark. It must be non-baryonic, it must be stable, because it's still around. And it must be actually rather massive, so that it's uh, not relativistically flying around very quickly, but rather sitting stable. And there are many, many candidates, some of them pictures here, WIMPs, axions, uh, many other ideas, but we don't know which one it is. For the inflation, um, this expansion was actually in a very short time a growth of the size of the universe by a factor of 10 to the 26, which I can't imagine, right? I don't know, maybe you can, but <laughs> I can't. So and the, the best idea we have today is that this is driven by a uh, by, by the cooling down of, of, a, of a scalar field and the quantum excitation of this field would be the inflaton. Again, this works mathematically, but we have no clue what this is, right? And then finally, the baryogenesis. So since a long time, uh, the, the famous Russian uh, physicist Sakharov, we know that we need three things. We need, uh, let's see, what we call CP violation. So this is simply the fact that that after all, antimatter has to be a little bit different than matter. Huh? Because if they were exactly identical, they would have all annihilated again. Um, we need barrier number violation because in the end of the day, we want to have more protons and neutrons than antiprotons and antineutrons. And uh, at some point, the, the universe must have been out of its thermal equilibrium. And uh, especially in a specific form, namely we need a phase transition there. Uh, the first order. I will explain later in a bit more detail what this, uh, what this means. So this we can contrast with what we <coughs> deal with in particle physics all the time. So I guess you all know that we have our uh, very famous uh, theory which is valid <laughs> since many decades and uh, which we thus call the standard model. This contains all the meta particles we know and uh, uh, particles representing all the forces we know and it actually uh, describes astonishingly well nearly all the observations which we have and to really uh, the level not only, yeah, not only to first order but really to the, down to the level of quantum fluctuations. And it's, uh, it, it rests only on, on very few fundamental pillars which is special relativity, quantum mechanics and uh, invariance under local gauge transformations for these specific groups which represent here the strong force, the weak force, and the electromagnetic force. And then, of course, there is the most recent uh, addition to it. Uh, most recently, yeah, six years ago, the Higgs boson was discovered as at the LHC. So, um, are we done? Is this the answer to all our questions? Of course not, right? Because there's no dark matter here, for instance, as you will see. So, there is really no, no candidate, neutrinos are too light, but um, maybe this new Higgs particle, maybe that is actually the portal to dark matter. Yeah? Maybe that is actually the only particle which connects the visible matter to the dark matter. Same for inflation. Um, I, I, I told you that we need a scalar potential and actually if the standard, if the standard model Higgs is really the standard model Higgs, it would be the first elementary spin zero, so scalar particle. Um, so obvious question is, could the Higgs field drive the inflation? Um, and uh, yeah, then of course tied to this is this 125 GeV particle discovered at the LHC. Is this really elementary or is this actually something composite, yeah, like a pion, yeah, spin zero. Okay, so finally for the baryogenesis, there is situations most complex because first of all, yes, we have CP violation in the standard model, which is an important result of lepton colliders, by the way, lower energies in the factories, um, but actually the quark sector um, has by far not enough CP violation. So we are urgently looking for some bigger source of CP violation. Um, baryon number violation, no, 
right? And up to now, we also didn't observe any proton decay. So, yeah, this is sort of a complete question mark. And then for the first order phase transition, well, we know that at some point, um, the, the, the electroweak force sort of split into the weak and the electromagnetic force. And this phase transition, yeah, which sort of then manifests as the Higgs bosons that give mass to, to all the particles, could this actually be the, the, the first order phase transition for, for electroweak biogenesis? Um, so could the Higgs field be responsible? We will see this in a, in a bit later, what it would need to, to make this happen. Good. So this basically tells you already a lot on what we want to actually achieve with the next generation of, of colliders, right? So we want to answer these questions, um, yeah, which I now introduced at length about the dark matter inflation and uh, uh, CP violation, biogenesis. But and in detail, this if you break this down a bit, this means of course sort of what is actually the mechanism about behind the electroweak symmetry breaking? How can the Higgs boson be as light as it is? Is it really elementary or is it composite? Uh, what gives the small neutrino mass masses and of course many others. So, but it's pretty much clear that whatever the answers are, they must, we can only find them outside the standard model of particle physics. So with no new particles discovered so far, what can we do? Well, we have a very nice toolbox here. I already explained to you yeah, that the Higgs could potentially be connected to many of these questions. But actually also with our good old known friends here, the, especially the most heavy quarks and the other uh, weak gauge bosons, they could tell us a lot if we study their properties in great detail. And of course, one can always be lucky in principle and really find completely new particles by chance. Yeah? But, I mean, so, um, so, but what would be the basic properties of a collider to, to do this program. So the most important thing is, of course, we need enough energy to produce the particles we want to study. And there is an important difference between the plus and minus collisions and protons. So protons uh, are, of course, comp composite objects. They have a structure. So if you shoot protons on, onto each other, then you, in a broadband way, sort of get all energies below the proton-proton center of mass energy, sort of say, automatically yeah, for, the, for the actual hard interaction between two quarks or two gluons. Downside, so that's in principle very practically, but, uh, uh, but on the downside you then don't know on an event-by-event -event level what the actual input energy of the collision was. Uh, so this is different, of course, if you collide elementary particles, they always have the energy they have, and if they annihilate, you get out, uh, yeah, uh, uh, particles with the same energies. On the downside, this means if you want to go to a different energy, you really have to do this by operating your accelerator in a different energy, right? You can't do it all at the same time. Uh, but the big asset is that in any case, you sort of know what you put in, and this has to come out again. So, which energies are we interested in? Well. First of all, there are those which we have already studied. So for instance, at the lab, the previous large electron-positron collider running on the, on, the, on the Z boson resonance, and then later also scanning the WW production threshold. And uh, yeah, we can, uh, with, with uh, higher event rates, one can actually still learn something here. But then the main focus now is the new kit on the block. Huh? So, and actually the, the lowest energy you need to produce a Higgs boson uh, is actually uh, around 250 GeV because you can't just produce a Higgs, you need a Z boson in addition. And then if you move on, in order to produce top quarks, yeah, you would need roughly 350 GeV. To produce two Higgses, you would need at least uh, 500 GeV. If you want top and Higgs together, then uh, you would also need about 500 GeV. And uh, then there is another interesting process with two Higgses, which would need even more energy. So the upshot here is, it starts to get interesting here. A lot can be done yeah, uh, if you have 500 GeV. And of course, then if you go even higher, and uh, you can also have surprises up here, but you can also have surprises actually at lower energies. And I will explain this, this later. So what other parameters are there besides the energy? Well, it's interesting how many collisions you have. So because that uh, 
makes your measurement statistically more precise if you have more events. Uh, and there, uh, if you want to compare different proposals, it's of course always important yeah, to consider how much uh, of this uh, luminosity has been assumed. Uh, but uh, one also needs to consider what is really a, a sensible amount of data to ask for, right? Are there any other boundaries beyond statistics coming from theory, from parametric uncertainties, from detector resolution, and so on? The other important parameter is actually what we call beam polarization. So electrons are part of positive electrons are spin half particles, and uh, yeah, we call them right-handed if their spin is sort of aligned with the momentum direction and left-handed if it's opposite, and the polarization is then this ratio, so if we have a bunch of uh, yeah, uh, millions or billions of particles, yeah, we just sort of count how many are right-handed, how many are left-handed, and the difference over the sum called the polarization, which is then a number between minus one and one. And this is good for three things. You can suppress backgrounds, you can enhance signals, and most importantly, you can you gain more information. You can really decompose um, your, uh, your, your signals and all your measurements in another additional dimension. Uh -huh. So we will see examples of that. So this was all theory. So uh, how does it look on the real axis? So on the real axis, what we at the moment really have as the only existing collider at the energy frontier is, of course, the LHC and uh, its luminosity upgrade. And then the plan is to, to collect until the mid-30s something like three inverse autobahn. Um, see here the, the sort of detailed time planning for that. And I mean the first thing, yeah, which always has to stress, this will still bring us really a lot of results, right? And very important results. But the question is what comes afterwards? Because to construct things like this with yeah, LHC is something like 30 kilometers long. Right? That's sort of the scale we are talking about. This takes, this takes 10, 15 years or longer yeah, to prepare and construct this. So if we want to sort of go on after the LHC finishes, we basically, the question is, can we already now identify some questions which we will, about which we will not learn enough at the Hailumi LHC? Right? So, or is there no chance? Can we just have, do we have to wait for this, all this data, and then start thinking? Huh? And, uh, hope I can convince you that uh, we already know now pretty well what we will need in addition to the LHC. So here are the key uh, contenders in the game. Uh, up here in this corner is the International Linear Collider, which is clearly the most mature project because it has already a technical design report uh, published uh, in 2012. The idea is here to, to cover energies from 200 to 500 GeV to have it even upgradable to, to 1 TeV. So this would stretch pretty much the whole um, uh, energy axis I had a few slides ago. And actually there was a very important update last year, namely what we call a staging proposal, namely that we start exactly at this very first interesting energy of 250 GeV. And this staging proposal, as is, yeah, the whole project is currently under review uh, by the Japanese government who is considering to, to maybe host this project. Furthermore, there is a proposal to build a linear collider at CERN, which is aiming for higher energies, so starting at 380 GeV and then going up to 3 TeV. So CLIC had a conceptual design report published five years ago and updated uh, this uh, significantly last year. Then uh, in China there's a proposal to build a circular E plus E minus collider which is aiming only for this sort of lowest interesting energy, at, uh, in this case 240 GeV. They a few years ago published what they called a pre-conceptual design <laughs> and they, they want to go for an engineering design in, in a couple of years from now. And they actually also considered to afterwards then put a proton-proton machine in the same tunnel like it was done with LAMP and LHC. And then of course there is the very big kit on the block, which would also be a proposal at CERN. So you see here the LHC ring and uh, this FCC thing would be a 100 kilometer ring here, circulating here the, the Mount Salev. 
And uh, this is mainly aiming for proton-proton collision, but would have the option to put also as a precursor an E plus and minus machine, which then would cover energies from the Z-pole up to the top threshold. So also they are trying to produce a conceptual design during this year, because uh, as some of you may know, then the uh, end of this year is the deadline for giving input to the next round of the European strategy for particle physics. Um, which then will hopefully make uh, a statement on uh, some of these projects. Good, so why are we discussing both linear and circular accelerators? Can't we make up our mind? Well, um, the, the point is here. The point is, uh, is uh, synchrotron radiation. So if you have charges uh, that accelerate them, and going around a curve is also acceleration, <laughs> uh, then they radiate. And uh, this, the energy loss goes with the energy to the fourth power over the mass to the fourth power and the radius. So at lab two, this was already 2 GeV per turn. Huh? And uh, now you can calculate what this means for the, uh, for the cost. So you can, of course, bring this down by increasing the radius, but then also your cost increases. Yeah? And of course, feeding in all this energy, uh, this also costs money. Yeah? And if you optimize this, you get very roughly a sort of something which depends on the energy squared in terms of costing symbolized here by this curve. Obviously, if you go linear, then you can just add more. And so, so a linear machine is linear with the, with the energy. Yeah? So this is this. And the magic point which we are discussing since quite some time is actually where on this unitless scales, where is this crossover point? Right? So this is what it is all about. Um, and uh, besides the cost, I mentioned the other important parameters like luminosity and energy. There you can see actually that the advantage of circular colliders is that they can have very, very high luminosities at low energies. Yeah? So can have ring, you can have multiple interaction regions. And also uh, important, they are even cleaner, right? So they, uh, yeah, they have uh, they have less intense interaction, so there is less accelerator background in those. However, the advantage of linear colliders is that you can that the <coughs> luminosity increases even with energy. So you can see if you would extrapolate this curve down, yeah, this would, <laughs> yeah, this would would uh, drop to very uninteresting values very quickly. So you can get high uh, luminosities um, at high energies and as I already said, you can simply extend them in energy. Right? A circular, once it's built, you cannot just blow it up. Yeah? So once you have built a circular machine, you are stuck with the radius you have. A linear machine, you can just extend on the edges. And there is another thing. Um, at the energies we are discussing, um, it seems that, that uh, most likely only linear colliders would, would be able to provide the, the beam polarization. Good. So um, this was sort of the introductory part. So let's um, see what we can actually learn with these proposals. And I will not start with the Higgs, but actually, uh, yeah, with our somewhat older friends like uh, the top and bottom quark and the um, I think the Z boson went to the backup. So I'll start with the quarks, right? So the basic mechanism to do physics in, in the plus and minus, the simplest you can do is you annihilate electron and positron into, uh, into pure energy. Here, for instance, a photon or, or a Z boson. And then you produce another fermion antifermion pair. And this vertex we know very well <coughs> from lab and SLC. But we are interested in what happens here at this point when this new pair of fermions is produced. And actually, this depends not only on the exchange particle, the force carrier particle here, but it also depends on whether these are left or right-handed fermions, antifermions, right? So this green dot symbolizes sort of four different parameters in the standard model, if you want. So now this is quantum mechanics, so um, we only see the beginning and the end. How do we have a clue to say whether this was a Z or a photon? Well, we don't, not on a single event. But if we have polarized beams, then this actually gives us a tool because the polarization dependence of the Z and the photon exchange is different. So not on a single event basis, but statistically on a whole sample, we can indeed very well then distinguish these uh, four parameters. 
good. And uh, yeah, besides uh, this, um, this has a few more advantages. So this works for any fermion and anti-fermion, but we are, what we are sort of maybe most interested in is actually the third generation of quarks here, because these are heaviest, and if the Higgs creates mass, then these must have a very close connection to the Higgs and thus to electroweak symmetry breaking. And actually, if we, uh, if we um, ask ourselves whether the Higgs boson is composite, many models which predict this also, uh, at least the top quark would then be partially composite, and this would certainly change its properties here. So this you can see here on this, uh, on this picture. So this shows two of these couplings, namely the couplings of the left-handed top quark to the Z boson and of the right-handed top quark to the Z boson. And they are normalized such that the standard model is just uh, sitting at zero, zero. And you just plot the, the deviation from the standard model. So now all these colored points are various proposed um, uh, exotic models, yeah? so this sort of just illustrates yeah, for you what, what could happen when one measures th these parameters. And uh, so, so this dashed <coughs> or dotted ellipse here, this is actually um, the best projection which we have, what Hailumi LHC could do in measuring. So this would be the sort of error ellipse here. Yeah? And for comparison, um, at 500 GeV, yeah, this is what, what uh, the ILC here could do. Yeah? This is the error ellipse on the, same, uh, on the same scale. So this is clearly the kind of precision you need if you want to sort of really pinpoint where you are on this plane. Um, and it's actually, actually interesting to note, I mean, this, this is probably a bit pessimistic, the size of this ellipse, because it's really an old uh, study. But still, it's important to note that the correlation direction is completely different between proton-proton and E plus E minus, right? So even if this one uh, shrinks by a factor or two or so, you will still see that this would be important uh, complementary information. And uh, actually, if you translate this into, into what is sort of the energy scale at which all these models really uh, become, uh, become important, this is in typical scenarios. 20 TeV, yeah, and in extreme cases up to 80 TeV, which you can sort of probe with that kind of precision. Um, question is, is 500 GeV really the point to do this? Can we do this at any energy? And this shows the precision on the x-axis parameter. Go back. Yeah, so the precision on this one here as a function of the center of mass energy. And it actually tells you that 500 GeV is not an arbitrary point for this measurement, but it's really the point yeah, where you get, for the same luminosity, uh, get sort of the best precision out of the whole game. Um, this you can also actually see here, which is a study done here in this institute. Um, namely, if you now add in the p-violation, you get even more of these couplings, not just the four we had before, and then they get complex. Uh, get complex phases, and you can see the same thing actually uh, actually here. Yeah, so the red thing is the same LHC study as the big ellipse on the previous slide. The blue is the ILC projections, and the green is the click projections. And the interesting thing is, if you, for instance, compare the, um, the sort of uh, hatched blue and green, this is the same amount of luminosity, but just at different energies. I see at 500 and click at 3. Uh, 380, and you see that the uncertainty at 500 is for the same luminosity, just uh, just bigger, which is exactly the same as on as on the previous plot. Of course, if you then in, uh, um, if you then go for the full blue and full green, you have a very different center of mass energies because the blue is still at 500 GeV, but four inverse autobahn, and the Green is then at 3 TeV. Yeah, and you see that you are more, more or less uh, equal. Right? So um, you can, of course, also ask whether this, um, this works at other colliders, and this is a bit assembled here. Right? So this is the plane of um, the real part here of the, the photon, the X, uh, here, the, the, this one here versus that one. Right? So these two are plotted here against each other. And you see, the, you see sort of the, the, the current atlas uh, measurement. You can also see um, uh, what the Hailumi LHC is 
uh, expected to do in this, this sort of big square here, and then you have this thinner stripe, what FCCHH thinks it can do. The horizontal band would be if you do electron protons collisions in the LHC, and then the tiny red dot, yeah, so this is what uh, corresponds here to the blue bars. Huh? So um, that is uh, really a, would be a, a significant step beyond uh, what, what any other uh, collider could do. So when I mentioned that there are many, there are projects we'll also just consider at least as a first, first stage 250 GeV. So then of course we can't produce top quarks. Now we screwed them completely. That's of course not so nice, but we still have the bottom quark, which is really the little sister of the top quark. And actually it le left us a mystery behind from lab days, because if you measure the weak mixing angle on different ways, yeah, there's actually since many uh, years a uh, uh, rather uh, striking discrepancy here between the measurement from SLD and the one involving beam quarks yeah, from lab. And uh, a good question is, can one actually at uh, the 250 GeV plus or minus collider remeasure this and improve? And uh, the answer is yes, we can. So this is this error bar is the red thing here now. And, uh, I see here at 250 could do this. Again, mind you need beam polarization to do this, so a circular machine which doesn't have beam polarization would not be able to do this. And if you translate this into new physics scale, this probes, depending on the model, of course, you assume this probes, again, multi, uh, multi 10 TeV regime. And can I actually, this has not been studied in, in full detector simulation yet. But you see there is also this thing from charm, which is the same for charm quarks, which has a rather huge error bar here from lab. Yeah? Um, we also would expect that one can, in a similar way, improve on that one, profiting actually from more than 30 years of advances in detector technology, yeah? especially vertex detector technology. Okay, so now moving on to our new friend, the Higgs boson. So, I already explained that we expect actually that the Higgs could have a lot to do with the, the question which we really want to answer. And uh, so how big can the effects which we want to observe in the Higgs properties, um, how big can they uh, be still, also given the fact that LHC so far didn't discover any new particles. And you can do this, of course, for any model you like, but at the end of the day you typically end up with, uh, with deviations, for instance, in the Higgs coupling to other particles of a few percent. Yeah? So here's an example from supersymmetry, here's one from composite Higgs models. You can actually also see that the patterns which occur um, are quite different, whether all couplings move up or down or so. so um, but at the end of the day, it's clear uh, the higher energy scales we want to probe, the more precision we need. And I mean, at least it's clear that we need something like a, like a percent uh, or so precision here to be able to see such deviations. Good. So how do we do this? Any plus or minus? Um, so here you see the production rate for Higgs boson and anything else <laughs> as a function of the center of mass energy. The first process which pops up said before is this production of a Z boson and a Higgs boson, and you see this has a really nice uh, maximum here near the threshold. But then um, at higher energies you can produce Higgs in this process, in the WW fusion process, um, which gives you more insights on the coupling between the Higgs and the, the W boson. And if you go to even higher energies like 500 GeV, you have these guys creeping in here, the top associated production and double Higgs production. And at even, more higher, even higher energies, yeah, you get this guy here, yeah, which is, uh, which is uh, basically the same as this one here, but then producing two Higgses. So this, for comparison, you can see here the energy ranges um, yeah, which the various E plus E minus projects uh, are aiming for. And you see, of course, that uh, this looks at the first side all very different. Um, and it's also clear, I think, that the full uh, 
program really requires more than 250 GeV, in particular if you want to do uh, these type of processes with the Higgs self-coupling or with the top Yukawa. Yeah, this is, uh, uh, yeah, these processes simply are kinematically forbidden at 250. Okay, so but 250 is very important and this is because of this process here, the Higgs and the Z production. This is really something which is very qualitatively different from hadron colliders. And it's really the key to why we always stress so much that electron-positron colliders can really measure these couplings uh, in, a, in a very model-independent way. And this is because we simply don't look at the Higgs boson at all in this process. So we know what we put in and we reconstruct the Z boson in its visible decays, for instance to leptons. And then we just use energy and momentum conservation. Yeah? So we say that uh, whatever is happening here, yeah, that this uh, is recoiling against the Z boson here, so we plug in the known center of mass energy and the measurement yeah, of, uh, of the Z boson decay products and outcomes what we call the recoil mass peak yeah? here in simulation. We nicely see that if you put in a Higgs, you get out a Higgs. <laughs> And um, um, this is then completely independent of what the Higgs decays into. It can decay completely invisibly. It can uh, yeah, decay to completely exotic stuff nobody has ever thought about. Yeah, this thing would always work and always show you this peak. Thus, from, from the amount of events here, you can just uh, get the total cross-section of this thing. Yeah? And this is something which is really conceptually impossible at, at hadron colliders to get this absolute normalization. This gives you then access to the total width and the absolute couplings and as I said also to invisible decays in a, with a really uh, minimal assumptions in it. So now is the slide a bit for, for, for the experts. The next one will be better again. So, because also during last year, uh, there was a sort of paradigm change in the way how we interpret these Higgs coupling uh, measurements. So, until recently, we used the so-called Kappa framework, which is simply assumes that whatever, uh, whatever is happening in, in beyond the standard model is simply a scaling factor applied to each of the couplings. Um, and these were called Kappa. So this means that that sort of no qualitatively new interaction was there. So you just changed the relative strength of the, the, the Higgs boson interaction, but you didn't add a, a qualitatively new thing. This was called model independent because there was no assumption on any size or the coupling or the total width or the total normalization put in. So uh, the new kit on the block is uh, that it's very favorable to uh, uh, to do this actually in a, in a framework of effective field theories, especially um, this, uh, yeah, you can have many flavors of this, but what people typically do is they restrict themselves to dimension six operators and uh, say this has to be uh, consistent with uh, SU2 cross U1 gauge uh, invariance. And then you get something even more in model independent because now you also get qualitatively new interactions where the strength really depends on the energy of the involved particles, or what we call momentum-dependent operator. So and then you can actually uh, can actually see, so this would have been the, the same term as in the Kappa framework, but then you get sort of this, this additional uh, zeta here. So this gives you more parameters to determine and sort of more ways in which new physics can show up. And it of course comes with a general EFT fine print that you assume that there are no new light particles which is partially handled by the fact that then Higgs to invisible can be treated as an additional degree of freedom, so on top of all the, the operator stuff. So, and this then on the, on the other hand, this allows you to include more information. Yeah, you can input all your electroweak precision observables, and uh, um, uh, then you can also insert triple gauge coupling measurements. So, um, and to my knowledge, sort of the only official projections um, from, from the various projects, uh, the only project which has updated this is actually the ILC. So the others still have uh, couple of framework values at least published. Um, but at the end of the day, um, this, is not such a, this is not such a big deal. The yeah, just has to be aware of it, what one is comparing with what. Um, so, 
giving you an example of such a comparison, of course, this depends all on which energies you assume, which data sets you assume. So, for instance, this is the canonical ILC set to take two inverse Atoban at 250, uh, 200 inverse Femtoban at 350, and four inverse Atoban at, at 500 GeV, compared to, for instance, FCCEE, which is aiming for 10 inverse Atoban at 250, so a factor of five more here, and then 2.6 inverse Atoban at 350, and obviously nothing at, at 500 GeV. And then they get then they get these sort of numbers. This is, I think, depending on how many interaction regions they, they assume. Um, doesn't matter at this level. And these are really the most recent ILC parameters in this effective field theory framework. And uh, this, for, for, for the FCCE study, this is so far statistical uncertainties only. This includes sort of, as I said, more free parameters from the EFT fit but uh, it also includes uh, systematic uncertainties, at least on a, on a few important um, uh, parameters. And uh, these yellow numbers you also find here in, in this plot, where they are compared to LHC, so the red bars are the precisions which you get from high luminosity LHC in a model-dependent interpretation, so there you assume the total width is the standard model width, and put this in. The green things are from ILC, where you do not put in these assumptions and even have the full EFT interpretation. And then you see the light green is for 250 and the green thing is for the full 500, the dark green. So um, I think at the end of the day you see that these numbers here are very similar and all of them are a big improvement, a big step beyond uh, high Lumi LHC. So I think the fair, compa fair conclusion here is to say that, that despite all the different energy ranges and, and so on for, for sort of these standard couplings of the Higgs to light fermions, um, all the E plus E minus proposals at the end of the day reach similar uh, percent level precision, in some cases sub percent as you see, many of them are smaller than the percent, and typically improve a factor 10 with respect to Halumi LHC. So they really bring you into the range where you could actually expect uh, new models to show up. And then, of course, the details depend on the details, right? On running scenarios, systematic uncertainties, interpretation framework, and so on. But with a broad brush, I think yeah, this is all rather uh, comparable. Um, then I would like, speaking of parametric uncertainties, I would like to say one word about uh, actually also the Higgs mass, because with this recoil technique, you can get also a very clean and uh, precise measurement uh, about uh, on the Higgs mass. And uh, um, it's interesting to ask how well, are we, uh, how well do we need to know this? Why are we interested to know this, the 10 digits behind the dot also? Huh? The, the, um, for many applications, actually, the LHC precision is perfectly OK. Um, one, there's one notable exception, and this is actually the partial width of the Higgs decays to gauge bosons. Um, they are, um, yeah, because of the star here, basically, meaning that one of the gauge bosons is off-shell, this is very sensitive uh, to the Higgs mass because the phase space changes a lot, which you have for that decay. So this means that the relative errors on the effective couplings, yeah, which are in a narrow width approximations so are just the square root of, proportional to the square root of the partial width, then are typically around about seven times the relative error on the, on the Higgs mass. Yeah? Um, so if you plug this number here in of two per mil, then you see that the parametric uncertainties, for instance, from the, uh, for the W coupling of the Higgs to W would be 1.4%, which is a factor of whatever three or so larger than claimed on the previous page for the experimental measurement. So that is no good. Um, if you do this mass measurement at a lepton collider here, you see that you get this 1.4% down to the mil, per mil or even half a per mil level. So that would be okay, and I mean, that is certainly the level where you then don't worry about uh, the Higgs mass value, but for instance about the assuming a narrow width approximation in the first place and things like that. Yeah. So, um, so also there, the lepton collider would get you at least this consistent uh, set of inputs to really do a precision interpretation of all this. So then we are looking for CP violation. And actually, it could be that the Higgs is not the pure CP even state 
as, it, as which it is predicted in the standard model. So, um, to understand this, you really need your hands, at least I do. <laughs> so, what one does is you can say, okay, maybe the Higgs is a, a superposition of something which is CPU and something which is CPU odd. Yeah? And to conserve the normalization, you put in the cosine and the sine. And then, how would you know? Well, if the Higgs decays to fermions, yeah, it is a spin zero state in total, so these fermions need to have opposite spin configurations. But the question is, is there a plus in between the two wave functions or a minus? Right? So a plus would be, and this you symbolize with this psi angle here, e to the 2i psi, and then if psi is uh, zero, it's pure CP even, so this would be one. And a pure plus, and for pi half it would be CP odd, so then this E function would give you a minus one and minus sign in between. So if the Higgs decays to, say, um, uh, whatever, a charm quark, it's very hard to know whether the charm quark is left handed or right handed or whatever. But actually, if the Higgs decays to taus, since the taus decay further, can actually define a polarization analysis for the taus. And this has been studied in full based detector simulation recently for ILD. And, and uh, you, um, you see here the, the, uh, one, of, one of the angles of the tau decay products yeah, for, different, uh, uh, yeah, for different assumptions of the psi. Yeah? And you see how this changes here from being like this or being like that. And if you, uh, if you fit these kind of distribution, you can see that you measure the CP phase, so the psi value, to better than 4 degree. Um, and you can actually also do similar things in the, in the, um, in the Z-Higgs coupling. Yeah? So there you can also have search for CP violation and limit the CP violating factor to, to less than a per mil. Good. Um, now moving on to a bit to the higher energies. The Higgs and the top quark, I said already, they are probably very tightly connected simply due to the high mass of the top quark. And all we know today about their coupling basically comes from this thing here, namely the production at the LHC, which is gluon-gluon fusion forming a Higgs via a loop. And, and in the standard model, the thing in the, top, uh, in the loop is the top quark. Yeah, so if we assume the standard model is val valid, then of course we can just say, okay, this strength here contains the, the top loop cover coupling. But of course, in principle, there could be other things in the loop, right? There could be new things. So if we want to really have this in a foolproof way, we actually want to see that we produce a pair of top, uh, top and anti-top, and either the top or the anti-top radiates off the Higgs boson, which we see in the detector. So. Um, so, this of course can happen at the LHC as well, and uh, um, however the cross-section is really small and uh, sort of theory level studies indicate that, um, yeah, maybe you get a 10% level with, with high Lumi LHC, but uh, this is not full detector simulation, this is just sort of, uh, yeah, um, cross-section level studies. So what is the situation in E plus E minus? So the threshold, kinematic threshold for that kind of process is uh, at uh, near 500 GV or precisely at uh, 475 GV. So you see that actually the cross section, which is the blue curve, um, is at 500 GV is still steeply rising. Huh? So if one would really sit exactly at 500 GV, then for instance the full ISC running scenario would give you uh, something like 6% on this coupling. But if you just would be able to move, to increase the energy by 10% and in the end sit here, <coughs> yeah, this 6.3 would go to 2.5%. Um, yeah, so in that sense it's maybe not that bad to start with 250 and hope that uh, by the time one gets to 500 accelerator technology is, uh, uh, and gradient has improved such that it would be easy to actually go to 550 instead of 500 exactly. <coughs> If you go to even higher energies, you, uh, this cross-section at some point, of course, starts to drop down again. Yeah? So at 1 TeV, you get roughly the same number as at 550. And at even higher energies, uh, yeah, you really fight the dropping 
uh, cross-section, unfortunately, but you still get, get of course, quite uh, nice net measurements, but it's not, not really improving things. So now if you throw all you have learned so far about the Higgs boson together, and of course ask you, what does this tell you about uh, actually potential uh, new physics uh, around? So this has been tested in, in, in this study here, where I think nine models were picked such that um, they are all unobservable at the higher luminosity LHC, so no new particle discovered. Yeah, and all of Hylumi LHC and no deviation seen in any other parameter measured at the LHC. And then you see what do the Higgs uh, couplings look like in these models and what could, for instance, the ILC in this case measure. So this is here for the first phase of, of the ILC at 250 GeV and uh, here are these, all these models uh, two times and the standard model is there as well. So the first column basically tells you how uh, the number of standard deviations which you would get comparing the measured data then to the standard model, assuming each in turn each of these models. So you see about half of them you would get very clear discoveries and the other half would be, uh, yeah, so something is going on, three sigma, four sigma, but you're not really sure. Huh? So then, um, if you then add the 500 GeV data, yeah, you see this whole thing turns green, right? So you are everywhere apart from some intermodel distinctions here between some uh, two exotic models, yeah, but with respect to the standard model and most of the other cross-model distinctions, you are way beyond five sigma. And of course, if you're way beyond five sigma, you could say you can also increase the energy scale behind these models and still see them. Um, so, the one parameter of the Higgs I've not talked about so far is the Higgs self-coupling. And uh, this is actually one of the parameters which has the closest uh, relation yeah, to, to our cosmological questions. So, as we said in the beginning, what we would need for electronic biogenesis would be a first order phase transition. Now, in the standard order, it turns out, with the Higgs mass we have, we would have a second order phase transition, yeah? So, which is sort of lacking this intermediate bump here. Yeah? So this thing here is not there, so you just smoothly roll down and here you have to tunnel at some point to get through. However, many, many uh, models have been proposed which influence the value of the Higgs self-coupling and thus the shape of this potential. And the interesting thing is that these can actually be large, even if all the other couplings are, have only small deviations. Yeah? References to lead the, the, read this up. And uh, for instance, in general, two Higgs doublet models, yeah, it turns out that if you want to have electronic baryogenesis, you need at least a 20% larger coupling than in the standard model. This is here on, seen on this plot um, yeah, for this particular two Higgs doublet model incarnation. Yeah? So you, you have to be on the right-hand side of, of this line, so uh, more than 120% sort of, of, the, uh, of the standard model value. So now, how would one measure this thing? So the first thing which one, as an experimentalist, really wants to see is to, to, to observe double Higgs production, yeah? which so far has not been observed anywhere, and at the moment at five sigma level at least otherwise, you can't measure anything. And then if you have done this, then you can try to extract the value of the self-coupling from the cross-section. And unfortunately, this is really challenging at any collider. And a part of the reason, besides this being a rare process, is actually this, that you have inter in interference between diagrams which produce two Higgses but do not contain the Higgs self-coupling and the ones which you are actually interested in. So the ones which really have this, this vertex here. So, um, so you are sort of always facing a double slit experiment and you don't know where the light went through, right? And you only want to, want to see the pattern of that slit and not of that one. So that, is, that makes the whole thing a bit tricky. So let's see what we can do. So at the high luminosity LHC, there's been a recent projection from ATLAS. Um, which is, mind you, still generator level plus smearing. So this has not the full complication of, for instance, jet finding, which is also the 
of course, uh, um, an important additional challenge. Still, it turns out that for the observation of the standard model predicted rate for double X production, you end up at less than three sigma. And see this a bit here on this plot, which shows you the ratio of the sort of true Higgs self-coupling over the standard model prediction. So the standard model prediction would be here at one. The red thing is the, the cross-section predicted by the standard model, and the black dots is the two sigma exclusion limit. And you see that you can't even sort of exclude the standard model uh, range here. So what you can exclude is really extreme values, saying that you would be you can exclude sort of where, where, the, where the black line is lower than the red line. So negative values and values larger than eight times the standard model value you can exclude. And this is still assumes that all the other couplings are exactly standard model-like. Um, so now in E plus E minus, what can you do? So the lowest energy which you need in any case for this is 500 GeV. So now using full Monte Carlo, full detector simulation, yeah, with all uh, complications of, of hadronization, fragmentation, and jet finding, and so on. Um, uh, in this thesis, a sort of eight sigma observation for this process has been uh, demonstrated. This would be possible at uh, yeah at, at, at 500 GeV with, with IDC conditions, and then you can cons uh, if the self coupling has the standard model value, then you can extract it with 27 percent uncertainty, which is not great, but but better than nothing. Um, right, and also it was recently demonstrated here in this paper that uh, you can actually do this even if you, um, uh, if you don't fix all the other couplings, right? So you basically drop this constraint here also in this process. Good. So above 500 GeV, you have this other process coming in from the WW fusion, and you see you can get even better. Huh? And uh, uh, actually, especially if you go to very high energies, you can uh, you get enough events to, to, to include actually differential distributions in the whole thing, so that you get uh, to the 10% uh, level for this coupling. But all these numbers are assuming the standard model is correct. So what happens? If we I mean, actually hope that it's not correct, right? So what happens then? And um, this is shown here on this plot. Um, yeah, again, you have the, the, the value of the coupling over the standard model. So the standard model is sitting here at 1. And uh, the red line is the precision you expect from the 500 GeV measurement. And the blue line is for the 1 TeV measurement. And now as a function of the value of lambda itself. So here you see the, the roughly 10 percentage uh, thing at, for the standard model and the 27 percentage thing, it's an old plot where the analysis was still a bit worse, but in principle it's, uh, it's exactly that effect. And then you see if you go into this region which is interesting for electric biogenesis, the picture changes completely, right? So here actually the cross-section yeah, goes through a minimum, so you have even a double solution and you, you, you basically from this process here, you don't learn anything if you're here in the worst point. But this one here really uh, nicely gets better even. Yeah? So you even nicely get sort of always, if you combine these processes, you always get sort of a guaranteed uh, sensitivity to this process. Yeah? So I think in any case, um, A plus E minus with at least 500 GeV or more really offers here significant added value with respect to Illumia LHC. And I think you really should aim to combine both of these processes to, be, to get the full picture here in case of BSM. So speaking about BSM, we uh, could of course also be very lucky and actually find new particles. Of course, the Hailumi LHC will explore lots of unknown territory still. And it's completely obvious that any E plus E minus region cannot compete with the pure energy reach, right? But question, the interesting question is, are there really qualitatively different searches which are not possible at high luminosity LHC? And uh, in principle, there are, right? So one, for instance, one example are extra Higgs bosons. So, um, so at the LHC, it's really difficult, for instance, to look for light Higgs bosons, which are lighter than, say, 100 GeV. 
It's also difficult for heavy Higgs bosons if you are in this famous wedge region with small tangent beta. Um, however, in the plus and minus, I mean, for the heavy ones, you get a loophole free search yeah, up to half the center of mass energy. That's trivial. So for click at the TV, yeah, you must be 1.4. Also, uh, TV, you can just say, bam, nothing. Either you see it or it's not there. Very easy, independent of other parameters. Or, and that's what I want to show in more detail, they could recoil against the Z even if the coupling is strongly reduced. So, um, this is again this recoil mass peak and full detector simulation. <coughs> this is for the standard model Higgs, so this one. And this here shows you here now, for illustration purposes, a generator level. That of course this would also show up if you have an additional lower mass peak state, right? So you would get just get another a second one of these peaks. So this is uh, this is ongoing and full detector simulation, but it has already been carried through on on, on theory level, anyway, like generator level, and the result you can see here. So this is the the sort of relative the relative strength of the signal compared to the standard model, which you can still see. This is the Higgs mass. And the blue thing is what we know from lab. Yeah. So you see at the, for very low Higgs masses, you are sort of at a percent of the standard model prediction, and then it goes up here. This is 10% 10, 10 of the standard model here, 20% or so here at the kinematic limit. And then the yellow and the red are two things yeah, depending on which method you choose, um, yeah, a more model dependent one or a more model independent one, you can see what what an ILC even at 250 G could add, yeah, or a CPC or a FCCE. Uh, so you see that there is a bar, all this yellow and reddish area and principal things, yeah, which uh, where there could be discoveries still hiding, even if high luminosity LHC does not see anything. Another example is dark matter. Um, so, searching for dark matter in electron-positron collisions is very complementary to LHC and actually also to direct detections because in one case you probe the coupling between the dark matter and hadrons and on the other hand you probe their couplings to leptons. And uh, in, the, in the quantitative sense it's also on whether you have a large range in the mediator scale or a large range in the, in, in the, in the dark matter mass. Um, so, uh, yeah, if you use in, in, so in effective uh, field theories, yeah, you get at 500 GeV up to more than 3 TeV in the, in the, uh, in the new physics uh, scale, for instance. But what I want to, to show here also is that beam polarization is very important for this because in this case it simply suppresses your standard model backgrounds by roughly a factor 10 and this means you increase your energy reach by about a TeV. Yeah? Um, and if you see a signal, it can also help you to determine what the type of new physics is. So here you can see just with a small, very small data set of 500 inverse femtobahn, yeah, you can see here the, this in a simplified model compared to the current CMS uh, exclusion region. Yeah? And uh, if you go to the full ILC data set, yeah, you would end up on the, somewhere on the edge of the screen also with the blue curve. This is, uh, this, the simplified model update is still ongoing and preliminary, but, uh, so I don't show you the final plot yet. So, but you can also ask how don't we see this really beforehand from direct detection, from indirect detection, and there was an interesting study done here in, in, in this paper where really for various types of WIMP models um, they did a likelihood scan over the whole parameter space of these models including all existing and all future direct, indirect and uh, collider experiments apart from ILC. Yeah? So Hailumi LHC projections are included, future direct detection and so on is included but not the ILC. And then, the yellow thing is what survives. Uh, the, the, the gray thing is, is sort of theoretically uh, excluded, and the yellow thing is what survives. So this, so here is 100 GeV. Yeah. So even 
even at uh, 250 GeV, you would already eat away quite a bit of this. And see this in more detail. At 250 GeV, you go up to 2 TeV, which is not. And at, uh, so this is here. Right, so there's something staying up here, and this is of course staying, and if you go up in energy, you also go up in, in mediator scale, in this case, as you can see here, uh, and heat up here, and uh, one TV in this particular model, there would still be a tiny thing left there, yeah? so you would actually need a polarized three TV machine to heat this up completely, right? But, uh, so, so you, um, so you see, it's, uh, there's no reason to be depressed yet. But I mean, if we have done all these and we still don't see anything, then we have to be depressed. <laughs> okay, final example from, from Exotica. You probably all have seen these type of plots. These are not the recent ones. This is also not the main point. The main point is that if you take a somewhat older one, you see that all these bars, which so exclusion ranges, they all start at zero. And uh, two years later, people realize that this is actually not in all cases true. And nowadays, these plots <coughs> have bars which don't start at zero, but holes are appearing here in these plots. Huh? So, um, uh, going a bit more quantitative than that, actually, Atlas uh, uh, two years ago did, did a very nice uh, study with a PMSSM scan, and they sort of cross-checked their own simplified model limits with a PMSSM scan. And I, I show this because I think it's very important that actually here the, the experimental collaboration did it themselves, right? So it's not a question about theorists interpreting the data not in the right way, right? But it's really a consistent set. So you see here um, the sim white line on this LSP versus next to a light Susie particle plane, mass plane. This is the limit from the simplified model, where they assume that the chargino can only decay into the neutralino. And then they said everything below the white line is excluded and everything outside the white line here would be allowed. So the color map shows you now um, the fraction of models which are actually excluded by, um, uh, in this PMSSM scan. So, um, you see that actually uh, the, the scan results yeah, have nothing to do with this exclusion curve. Yeah? So um, you have models, you have here, the only thing where you are sort of watertight here in this near to one region is actually this, which comes from the left char genome limit, so from E plus E minus input. And then in here, yeah, typically, yeah, when you're in the cyan region, or cyan to getting blue, yeah, you're at the 30% level, so only 30% of the models which are below this, this, this limit are actually excluded. Yeah? Um, and then you also have some models outside here which are excluded, but you see it's a small, smaller and smaller fraction. So now some people say that SUSI is particularly attractive if actually um, you are sitting here on this diagonal, yeah, this for experts with a small new parameter, um, and uh, you see that here, you are also at the lower energies in this 30 percentage region of, of excluded models. Yeah? Um, so what this gives you in, as an, for experimentalists is typically that you then have the lightest SUSI particles, so these things plotted here, xenos, <coughs> and this means they have very, very small mass differences and are sitting here <coughs> have already on this diagonal and are actually very difficult to see. So this is... Um, yeah, at the LHC. At the lepton collider, they jump into your eye, as you can see here. So this is a model point sitting roughly where the star is. And uh, this is what one would see in E plus E minus at 500 GeV. The red thing is all the, the background, and the yellow thing is all the signal. So you clearly easily see that there is something. Yeah. No doubt about that. And I think this nicely illustrates, again, the complementarity between proton, proton, and E plus E minus, because this sort of region, which is very difficult for the LHC, is really easy in E plus E minus. And uh, for the experts, right, the, this precise model points has even the, the Bino mass parameter at 5 TeV and uh, the Wino at 10 TeV, while the Atlas scan only went up to 4 TeV in both. Yeah? So this is even not included at all. So we did uh, actually 
various benchmarks with small mass difference ranging from sub GeV to, to a few uh, GeV in various models, in PMSSM, in NUHM2, hybrid gauge gravity mediation, virage unification, so um, uh, lots of fun. However, experimentally they are all rather similar. You have these xenos with very small mass differences. And here you see what you can actually do in terms, if you see a signal in the previous model point there, in terms of, of um, parameter determination. So this is exactly we know mass versus we know mass plane now, and the blue point is the model point here at 5 and 10 TeV. And actually the red stretch here is what survives after your measurement, right? So you cannot really measure that point, but you can constrain that you are on sort of this banana here. And um, um, so actually, if you want to have mass unification in the gauge no sector, yeah, you know that you have to lie on this line. Huh? So then, in principle, if you assume that, you would even find a lower limit on, on where you are. That you can, um, you can do, if you, the, this is sort of for this very extreme mass difference case, if you go to slightly larger mass differences, you get very nice determinations of M1 and M2, and then you can actually run them up to the gut scale and you can test whether they unify. So here in this case, the case it has been assumed that Halumi LHC would, be a, would see a Gluino and give you the, the blue band, but even if you just had the, the, the green and the red band, you would nicely see where they cross. And this is a more challenging scenario and also more interesting one, because as you see in this case, um, they don't cross at the gut scale. So actually experimentally you, base, you see very, very similar thing, things. Yeah? But, uh, in this case, uh, if you then run the couplings, you see that they don't unify up here, but unify there. And this is exactly this merge unification model which has been put in, and you see one can sort of clearly tell them apart. So I think that's really cool, right? I can sort of measure at 500 GeV and find out what is going on at 10 to the 16 GeV. Yeah? So that's and I mean, if you see a signal like that and interpret it in a way, I think then you would be really ready to argue for a 100 TV proton proton machine, right? If you know that there are, can prove that there are particles sitting at 50 TV, then um, this would really be what you need. So this brings me to my conclusion. So I. I hope I convinced you that the LHC cannot be our last collider, so a collider, but that really to open the big questions of particle physics and to really expand the understanding of our universe, we need at least one more. And uh, I think already any plus and minus collider with a rather modest energy um, offers uh, very good physics prospects as long as it has polarized beams. Um, and it's clearly such a machine goes significantly beyond what Halumi LHC can tell us. This applies in particular to the uh, precision measurement of fermions, gauge bosons, and of course the Higgs boson properties, but it also has a direct search uh, potential which is complementary to, to, to hadron colliders because it's qualitatively different. On the other hand, I also showed you that 250 clearly can only be a first step. Right? I mean, there are important thresholds which we know today yeah, to explore to at least up to 500 GeV, if not a TeV, especially for top quark production, uh, but also for the Higgs self-coupling and the top Yukawa coupling. And then there might even be surprises. Right? So, and in this context, one must say that really linear colliders are intrinsically upgradable in energy, yeah, and while circular colliders are not. The Japanese government is currently really investigating the possibility to host um, the ILC. We expect an official statement from them this year in time for the update uh, of the European particle physics strategy. And uh, I really think this is a unique uh, window of opportunity which we would have if the statement uh, really comes. Yeah? So, and if this is the case, then my personal uh, conclusion is really that the worldwide particle physics community should make it a priority to uh, get this project funded and constructed. Thank you. Thank you, Jenny, for a very comprehensive review. We have about 10 minutes for questions, so anything urgent, anyone? I'm hungry.
if you want, if you want to reconstruct the Lagrangian of the scalar sector, and that there is a measurement of the self couplings of the fields, mm -hmm. is fundamental. At 250 GeV, you cannot do it. Yes. You presented the situation for 500 GeV. Yes. My question is, what is the minimum energy and luminosity which uh, could be able to, to measure these couplings, let us put that five sigma, six sigma at least? Okay, what I showed you is that for 500, I mean 500 GeV is the minimum energy, okay? Beyond, below that, uh, no way. Um, is what I started, and what I showed you is that for four inverse Ato barn you get eight sigma, right? So you can, so I don't have the plot as a function of, of luminosity, yeah, but I mean, of course, you cross, you cross five sigma below that probably with three inverse Ato barn no. or whatever, yeah? So, um, but then the target will be 500 GV in that case, no? Yes. Yes. Okay, thank you. With the target uh, the position that you are promising to, to reach at the linear collider, my bet is that the uh, EFT approach will not be enough, that you will have to include higher order, higher order uh, progression. Absolutely. So absolutely. there has been quite a lot of progress in the LHC, and for the linear collider you will also need a similar, similar approach. This has partly been worked on, yeah, and, uh, and uh, uh, on the theoretical level, right? I mean, not yet ready to be applied to say the full experimental studies yet but you are absolutely right and I mean in the end I would even turn it around right I mean the EFT is, is very useful to, to, to give you a yeah, sort of first order uh, estimate on, on what you are talking about but in the end with the precisions from lepton colliders you want to plug in a real model right with all its higher order correction, right? So, I mean, for SUSY, we do this, uh, yeah, as a standard way, right? Because that's the model where we have all the calculations, right? So, uh, I think by the, if we really get such a machine, then, I mean, there is a huge theory uh, homework program, right? To, especially when sees see the deviation from the standard model, yeah, then we need to calculate to, to loop level all kinds of models which fit on, on such a deviation that would be very crucial. Yeah, I agree. I think the, yeah. the EFT is only the first this step. Is only the first Once step. you know which of the operators going away yeah. from zero, then yeah. you go back to concrete models immediately. Mm -hmm. Further questions? You have shown which are the precision you can get for the coupling of the Higgs to light fermion, for example, mu mu. Mm -hmm. How things change if you look at the flavor changing channels? For example, Higgs mu electron well, or Higgs uh, charm up, quark, etc. Yeah, that's of, that's of course also important studies. I mean, typically on the very exotic channels LHC is doing not too bad, right? Because sort of having a very striking signature of when Higgs going to electron and, and muon, right? This is easy seeable also in a messy environment. Yeah? So you need very high rates. Yeah? So but there are there are also there are also studies um, there are also studies uh, for, for this, right? But that is uh, um, yeah, this is clearly something one would do, but it's, I guess, not the main selling point uh, of these colliders. Right, I think things like uh, tau mu and electron muon and those things are probably better than a tau of colliders. Yeah. If it's quarks and charm tagging becomes important, yeah. then. then yeah. And we haven't really studied that in, mm -hmm. in enough detail to give you a quantitative answer, I think. Yeah, I think we study it, for instance, for, for top quark decays, right? Flavor, flavor changing, neutral current, top quark decays, yeah, to charm X, say, right? This is something where lepton colliders are competitive. Further questions? If not, I think we should thank Jenny again.